نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله ارسله الله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على دين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا اما بعد continue with our discussion on how to keep your slate clean that we sin all of the children of adam are sinners and the best of the sinners are those who repent and as muslims we work very diligently to clean our slate to keep our record of good deeds or a record of deeds free from sins that we will have to atone for on the day of judgment so there are many mechanisms there are many things that we have in our religion that helps us to wipe our slate clean we come to number five from the things that helps us to or going back to the last issue that we discussed which was trials and tribulations that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests you he uses that as a means of wiping your slate clean freeing you from sin cleansing you from sin and those trials and tribulations could be related to your deen or they could be related to your physical health your wealth your children the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned an authentic hadith ma yusibu al-muslim min nasbin wala wasbin wala hammin wala huznin wala ghammin wala adha hatta ash-shawka yushaku hatta ash-shawka yushakuha illa kafara Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala biha الخطايا وفي رواية قال ما يزال البلاء بالمؤمن والمؤمنة في نفسه ووالده وماله حتى يلقى الله وما عليه خطيئة. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said that nothing befalls a Muslim. ما يصيب المسلم. Nothing befalls a Muslim from نصب fatigue tiredness. ولا وصب or any disease ولا هم nor sorrow ولا حزن nor grief ولا غم nor distress ولا أذى nor any physical pain حتى شوكة يشاكها even the prickling of a thorn even the prickling of a thorn except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala كفر الله Subhanahu wa ta'ala biha al khataya Except that Allah will remove from you sins. So if you look in this hadith, he's talking about physical pain, the prickling of a thorn, stumping your toe, the pain that you feel. You know, Allah forbid any accident or something that you get into, any pain. Your pain has value. Your, faith, your physical pain, it has value. So there's no need to go through something and then turn to drugs or alcohol or anything like that. Your physical, your physical pain has value with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that Allah will remove from you in exchange for the pain that you feel, sins. Allah will remove sins from you because of the pain that you feel. He said, going back, he said, fatigue. You get up, you go to work, you're tired. You get up in the morning, you drag yourself out of the bed to get to the masjid to pray Salatul Fajr. Allah knows. Allah knows it's, it's difficult. Allah knows it's painful. You're, you're at work and you just, you're counting down the minutes that you can get off. And then when you get off, you still got to go shopping. You still got to go grocery shopping. You still got to go cash a check. You still got to go pay bills. And you, your bed is there and you just can't get to it. You see your bed right in front of you. You just can't get to it. When you get home, you got to cater to children. You know, especially women, they have to cook. They have to clean. They have to do that. And then, you know, then you have also people have you know, social connections to you. You got to call this one and you forgot to call that one. And people holding you accountable the whole while. It's like, I text you earlier, you didn't text me back. It's like, I'm tired. I got a million and one things on my plate. 
please cut me some slack. People are no, have no mercy. Meaning when they text you, they want a response. And they're gonna hold you accountable for that. Children, you promised them early in the week that when you got paid or when you got off, you was gonna take them here, take them there. They're not gonna let you go on that. You told us, you promised us you was gonna take us here. This is the life of a parent. And there's fatigue involved in that. Fatigue. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward you for that. Wala wasabin. Nor any disease. We have brothers and sisters who, you know, are suffering from many diseases, many ailments. Whether it's cancer, whether it's diabetes. You know, these things are rampant in our community as Muslims. You have people who are suffering from diseases. Diseases that they were either born with or because of the foods they ate or because of the lifestyles or something they inherited from their children uh, or from their parents. Nor any disease befalls you for the duration of the time that you endure the pain from that. Think about someone who has to go to chemotherapy and they lose their hair. They lose their, the hair on their face. They lose their hair on their head. Sheikh Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala who died from colon cancer. Sheikh Muhammad ibn Saleh al Uthaymin Rahimallah ta'ala. His wife had to beg him to go get chemotherapy because his fear was that after the chemo, the hair on my face would fall off and there's no way that I could sit in front of my students and give a lecture with no hair on my face. How do I, as a scholar, well respected in Islam, sit in front of my students and give a lecture with no hair on my face, no hair on my head? And he avoided chemotherapy for such a long time until the cancer increased to such a degree that by the time he got the chemo, it, it really didn't matter. Sheikh Al-Taymin was mentioned in his biography that he was giving a lecture during the time of, of Hajj. He would go down from where he was in Qasim and he would go down to the area of Mecca. And he would sit in the haram and he would teach people, teach his students. And one day he fell ill, very sick, and they had to rush him to the hospital in Jeddah. Jeddah and Mecca, about maybe a 35, 45 minute distance. And in the hospital in Mecca, uh, in the hospital in Jeddah, he was hooked up to machines and he had two phones in his room where he was still picking up phones, answering phone calls. And then he was away, it was the last 10 nights of Ramadan. And the Sheikh, he hated to be away from the Haram the last 10 nights of Ramadan because he would pray Tarawih, and then after Tarawih, he would start his lessons. And then after his lecture, he would get up and pray to Hajjah with the Jama'ah, spending his whole night in worship as we should. But he was gone from the masjid for a few nights and he felt bad. He was connected to the machine that was giving him oxygen and another machine that was connected, the IV connected to him. Shaykh Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala, wallahi, grabbed the, the oxygen tank and the machine that was the IV and he went and he got in a car and he drove from Jeddah to Mecca. He's sitting in the haram in the haram with the IV in his arm with the machine, the oxygen mask on giving a lecture in the haram. SubhanAllah You're talking about a scholar dedicated to teaching people Islam. La ilaha illallah. But the pain that he suffered, the pain that he went through, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is removing sin from you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your, your pain is valuable. It's worth something in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no disease befalls you. No sorrow. Wala hamman, wala huznan, wala ghammin. No sorrow or grief or distress or anxiety. You can't imagine. Children suffer from distress and anxiety today. Children are taking medication for anxiety, for distress, for depression. This is the times that we're living in right now, where children are taking medication for depression. SubhanAllah. 
You would think this would be third world problems, not first world problems, but here we are. But no grief or distress or sorrow. And the scholars say the difference between huzn and gham, the difference between grief and distress or sorrow is that distress or anxiety is for something that you fear that hasn't happened yet. And grief is for something that has already happened. And sometimes people suffer from both. Grief as well as anxiety. Anxiety is for something, a fear of something that actually has not happened yet. And grief is over something that has already happened. And there are people who suffer from both. He said, وَلَا أَذَن And nor any physical pain. Except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is removing sin from you. In another narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَا يَزَالُ الْبَلَا بِالْمُؤْمِنِ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَ That these type of trials and tribulations will continue to come to the believing man, the believing woman. It will continue to come to them in their selves, in their wealth, and in their health, and in their children. حَتَّى يَلْقَ اللَّهُ وَمَا عَلَيْهِ خَطِيئًا until they meet Allah and not a sin is upon them. And this hadith was collected in the jam of Imam Al-Tirmidhi on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala. Another mechanism by which we can clean our slate is by performing Hajj, the fifth pillar of Islam, which the season, the season of which has just passed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man hajja, man hajja falam yarfud, walam yafsuk. The Prophet said, Whoever performs Hajj and does not destroy his Hajj or invalidate his Hajj by doing acts that would destroy his Hajj, like being intimate with his wife until the, the period of Ihram is over, or engaging in acts or behaviors that would invalidate his Hajj. Then he returns home like the day his mother gave birth to him. La ilaha illallah. One act of hajj will remove all of the sins. And some of the scholars say that this includes even the major sins. Some of the scholars argue that this includes even the major sin. Because the Prophet ﷺ did not specify. He said, Raja'a min dhunubihi ya'ani ammatan. Ammatan. That he will return home free from his sins. And he left that general. He didn't say minor sins. He said, That he left it general. So we leave it. We leave it in general, just like he said it in general. He will return home from his sins like the day his mother gave birth to him. And I already explained before. That this means that we were not born in sin. We were not, as Christians believe, we were not born in sin. We were born in the repentance of Adam, because Adam repented. We were not born in the sin of Adam. In the, Bible, in the Bible, there's no mention of Adam repenting. So Christians believe that Adam sinned, and every child born to Adam after that is born in the sin of Adam. Making it inappropriate for him to approach God or her to approach God by themselves so therefore he sent his only begotten son to die for the sins of mankind so that you can go through Jesus to get to God I mean the concept even within itself actually doesn't even make sense it's a concept, a man-made concept. There's no way in the world that God would reveal a concept that would make you go through one of his creation in order to get to him. No way that a God who created creation would make you go through another creature to get to him. Just using logic. Just using human logic. Basic human logic that God gave you. There's no way that God, the Creator, the Almighty, the All-Powerful, the All-Forgiven, the Most Merciful would make you go through another human being to get to Him. Anyway, he said that you will return home from your sins like the day that your mother gave 
birth to you. Which means that you will return home sinless from your Hajj. For those of you who are listening, who have performed Hajj, congratulations. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from you and from us our righteous deeds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from you your Hajj and know that when you return home from Hajj, you now have a clean slate. Do not dirty your slate up by returning back to the same sins that you were engaging in before you went to make Hajj. That means that you wasted your money. Your money was wasted. If you paid $8,000 on a trip to go make Hajj and clean your slate and then return back to America and immediately engage in the same sins, then that means you wasted your money. And some scholars would argue that that actually means that your Hajj was not accepted. That is an indication that your Hajj غير مقبول, that your Hajj was not, accept, uh, not accepted because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Al Jaza'ul Ihsan. Illa al-ihsan is not the reward of good, anything but good. Meaning good begets good. Good produces good. Good does not produce evil. You do not do a good deed like Hajj and then it produces evil deeds like returning back to America and engaging in the same sins that you were engaging in before you made Hajj. So if a person makes Hajj and returns home and engages in the same sins that they did before they made Hajj, the scholars argue that this is indication, this is an indication that your Hajj was ghayra maqbool, that your Hajj was not accepted. Your Hajj was not accepted because good produces good. If it was good, then you would produce more good, meaning when you return home from Hajj, you would not engage in those sins again. Even though you may fall into other sin, you are not going to engage in the same practices, same evil behavior that you engaged in before you made Hajj. Another mechanism that we can use to clean our slate is to renew our Shahada. The Prophet ﷺ said, Al Islam yajubu ma qabla. Islam wipes away the sins that were committed before it. Islam wipes away the sins that were committed before it. So while the person takes his shahada, if there's any of you who are new Muslims, new converts to the religion of Al-Islam, congratulations. You have a clean slate, you have a fresh start. As the scholars say, Safha Jadida. You start it with a new page. You have a new page in your life. Those of us who are Muslim, who have been Muslim, who have dirtied up our slate, <laughs> who've taken shahada and have engaged in sins that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, we only wish that we could be in the seat of a new shahada. Because you have a fresh start, you have a new page to start on, and from this point forward, it's all up to you. For those of us who have been Muslim, have taken shahada, born and raised Muslim, our record has started to be recorded from the moment we reach the age of puberty. We have so many sins to account for on the day of judgment. But for those of us who have been Muslim, we have a way that we can renew our shahada. You can renew your shahada by saying, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Walillahi alhamd, every time we pray, we renew our shahada. In the tashahud, we say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika la, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. We renew our shahada every salat. Every salat, we renew our shahada. So constantly uttering the statement, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Constantly renewing your shahada by saying, La ilaha illallah. This is one of the greatest statements that a person, that a Muslim can make. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah is the core of this religion. It is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets and messengers. For la ilaha illallah. This is the greatest statement that anyone could ever utter in their lives. La ilaha illallah is a statement that is written on your card. That on the day of judgment when Allah brings out your 99 sc scrolls, each scroll as far as the eyes can see, Allah will tell you to read your book. Look at all your sins in those 99 scrolls. 
And the man will say to himself, Halaktu, I'm destroyed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to you, Lazulmulyom, there will be no oppression today. And that card with your shahada will be brought out. And a scale would be brought out, and your 99 scrolls will be put in one scale. And your bitaka, your card with your shahada on it, will be put in another scale. And the man will turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Ya Allah, ma'ali hadihi al-bataka bi hadihi tis'a wa tis'een sajilla. What is this bitaka? What is this card going to do in the face of these 99 scrolls? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, you will not be oppressed today. And the 99 scrolls will be outweighed by this one little card with your shahada on it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell you, go ahead into paradise. That's how heavy this statement, la ilaha illallah is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, inna sanulki alika qawlin thaqila. We're going to give you a heavy word. A heavy word, colon thaqila. That heavy word is la ilaha illallah. Kalimatin tayyibah. It is the good word. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam tara kayfa darab Allahu matharan. Kalimatin tayyibatin ka shajaratin tayyibah. Asluha thabitun wa faruha fis sama. Can I not put forth an example of a good word, like a good tree? whose roots are firmly rooted in the ground and its branches spring up to the sky. And that good word is La ilaha illallah. So if you want to renew your shahada on a day-to-day -day basis, then be abundant in your pronouncement of the statement La ilaha illallah. And inshallah ta'ala will continue tomorrow bi idhnillahi ta'ala with other ways that we can clean our slate. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira wa subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.